But Mark chapter nine this morning, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this morning, for giving us this time and space, Lord, to study your word, to be with your people, Lord, to use our gifts, Lord. And we just ask that you would just honor, we would honor your word and you would bless your word, Lord, um, as you desire to teach us and show us exactly what we need to hear, not what we want to hear, Lord, but pray you would fill me with your spirit, fill us all with your spirit to learn, to be taught. It's in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, Mark chapter nine, we're going to be starting, and we're going to be starting in verse thirty. Although we're not going to go um, super in depth since we went over it already, but um, before we go there, um, if you looked around at our culture today, you can tell that uh, our culture seems to be obsessed with the notion of hierarchy: who's in charge or who has the upper hand. This can be with race, it can be with gender, it could be with uh, whether it's in, in the business world, you know, who's the boss. Um, it could be even economic, who has more money, you know, who has the power, who's in charge. In fact, we know that here, especially in our state, as uh, next week is the runoff election, and um, all of America seems to be looking to our state because they want to know, in the Senate at least, who is going to be in charge, who's going to have the upper hand. And with our culture's obsession with this, it seems that many have also desired to be the one who has the upper hand or the hierarchy. When, you're, when your culture is just so infused with um, who, who, the hierarchical status of everyone, and when we're told, even from a young age, that you know, it's good to be on top, well, you can see that many people, they live their lives desiring that very thing in every capacity of their life, whether it's at their job, maybe even in their homes, amongst their group of friends, amongst their community, at their church. But that's what our world does. That's what our culture does. That's what they're obsessed with. But what does the kingdom of God's hierarchy look like? Well, Jesus gives us a glimpse of that here this morning, and he does so in verse 30, 30 through 32, which we had read, but I'll read it again. Then they departed from there and passed through Galilee, and he did not want anyone to know it. At this time, he was um, starting to become very popular, but not in the necessarily good sense. Um, and this day and age, especially when it came to Rome, uh, anyone who started gaining a following was seen as a threat to Rome. And so Jesus knew this, and Jesus didn't want his ministry cut short or interrupted. Not that Rome could really do anything outside the um, approval of the Lord anyways, but he didn't want the wrong attention attracted to himself. And so he starts, we'll see that he starts moving a lot more stealthily up until that final week where he enters Jerusalem. And in verse 31, for he taught his disciples and said to them, the son of man is being betrayed into the hands of men and they will kill him. And after he is killed, he will rise the third day. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Again, we see Jesus very bluntly in telling them exactly what's about to happen. Earlier we saw when he said this, Peter decided to get up and rebuke Jesus. And Peter found out really quickly, just like he can speak for the Lord, he can also speak for Satan. But let's look again here at verse 32. It says they did not want to ask him. They were afraid to ask him. See, Jesus was open and willing to tell them, yet they wanted to seem as if they, they wanted to seem as if they did understand when real, in reality, they didn't understand it. They were afraid to say, I, I don't know what you're talking about here, Lord. I thought you were going to be the king. I thought you were going to be the one that ushered in the kingdom. You were gonna take out Rome and we were finally gonna get Israel back like we, we had back in the day. And with this notion of them not wanting to look ignorant, We'll see this develops even more in this next part, verse 33. Then he came to Capernaum, and when he was in the house, he asked them, what was it you disputed among yourselves on the road? But they kept silent, for on the road they had disputed among themselves who would be the greatest. 
Luke's gospel actually of this, um, this message um, shows that he already knew what they were talking about. He perceived their hearts is what it says. He's asking them, what were you guys to speak? He was really just wanting them to confess it. Lord, we're, we were discussing who's the greatest out of all of us, you know. And I can only imagine Peter, James, and John at this point kind of wanting to lay the trump card down that they're the greatest because they had just seen Jesus glorified on the mountain and they also got to see Elijah and Moses, but before they went down, Jesus says, don't tell anyone about it. And, you know, we kind of know who Peter is and I'm sure as, you know, uh, Matthew is saying, well, I'm the greatest. You know, Peter's sitting there saying, you have no idea, man, what I know. And I, you know, if I could, I would. I'd tell you I'm the greatest and here's why. Verse 34, it says they were, they kept silent because they were embarrassed about what they were talking about. They didn't answer him. All of us at some point when we were kids were met with this when our parents were saying, what, what did you say? What, what were you talking about? And you know it's not something you were supposed to be talking about. Oh, nothing, nothing. It would be nice to say that nowadays in, amongst the Lord's people, this kind of thinking has left the church. But unfortunately, it's not. They were all disputing who would be the greatest. They were all vying to be the top disciple. Now, what they weren't disputing was who was the best at being a disciple. Not the greatest in that sense, accomplishment-wise. They were disputing who was, in a hierarchical sense, who was the top disciple. Who's the one who speaks for all the disciples? Who's the one in charge of the disciples? Since the beginning of sin entering the world, it's been in the nature of man to want to be the greatest, to want to conquer, to want to lord over, to want to be superior to others, to want, and not just for you to be seen as good, but for others to be seen as not as good. <laughs> for you to be seen as the greatest and everyone else to be under you. And in verse 35, we see that Jesus knows exactly what they were talking about. And he sat down, called the 12, and said to them, if anyone desires to be first, the primary, the superior one, he shall be last of all and servant of all. See, Jesus knew exactly what they were arguing about and he brings them together and what he does is he really flips their whole idea of leadership around. They thought the one who should be the leader is the one who has all the accomplishments, the one who knows the most, the one who's the best In fact, if you've ever been in a business setting, you know that the model of the modern business world, um, of the leadership status is, is typically a triangle, right? And you have the, the very top dogs on top and then everyone under them kind of supporting them. Well, Jesus is flipping that whole idea upside down and he says, no, see, if you wanna be the primary, if you wanna be the first, if you wanna be the superior one, well, in fact, you have to be at the very bottom. You have to be the one serving all the ones that you think are under you. You have to be treating them as if they're above you. See, in the world's eyes, leadership is something that you have to attain by being better than others, and not only that, but making sure others see it, right? At your job, you wanna stand out amongst your peers, especially when it comes time for that review or that promotion. You have to, to put your numbers up against everyone else's numbers. And as they say, it's a dog-eat-dog -dog world out there, right? <laughs> and, and even though you're friends with your coworkers, in the end, they could be the ones standing in the way of that new house that you want or that new car that you desire 
or that recognition that you finally get. Maybe to finally be able to, to go home to your parents and say, look at what I've made of myself. Or to show everyone else that look what I've done. Look what I've accomplished. But see, Jesus says leadership is servanthood. In fact, there's many stories of in the earlier days of Calvary Chapel at the, the, where Calvary Chapel was birthed out of, Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa in Costa Mesa, California with Pastor Chuck Smith, that there would be many men that would come to that church to, because they felt like they had the calling of a pastor on their life. And so they would go and they'd either speak to Pastor Chuck or speak to his assistant, Romaine, who was a former Marine and was a really rough guy. Um, and they would say, you know, I really feel like the Lord has called me to be into ministry, to be a pastor, to teach, and to plant a church, and to lead many people. What they were expecting was kind of a red carpet of, wow, uh, I can't believe you'd be willing to, to do so much. Man, you must be so holy. You must be so righteous. And there's many stories of these men that would come in and do this and ask this and they would, be expect, they would expect a desk with a library full of commentaries and books so they could go and study because that's what a pastor does. And instead they were met with a toilet bowl cleaner or a plunger or a mop and they would say, if you want to be a pastor, well this is where it begins. And this is where it ends too. In fact, there are also many stories of Pastor Chuck even at the heyday of Calvary Chapel where someone would be walking into the restroom and there he was unclogging a toilet, cleaning a sink, picking up, uh, he was known um, to go to the church bef early in the morning and pick up all the cigarette butts that all the, the hippies had left out the night before in the parking lot. How many of your CEOs do you see cleaning up the bathroom or the break room? Taking out the trash. Helping the new employee See, in our worldly culture, that's just not how it's done. Our worldly culture, the more you make it up top, the less you have to do and the more people are doing for you, right? Jesus would actually show them this example later on when he goes to wash the disciples' feet, which was a job for the lowliest of servants. Because washing someone's feet was really part of the dirtiest part of their body. In fact, so much so that Peter, again, you know, Peter, he usually doesn't know what to say, so he just blurts something out. And when Jesus gets to Peter, he says, not so, Lord. I'm not gonna let you be my servant. You're the one in charge. Jesus, again, rebukes Peter for the umpteenth time <laughs> that we have recorded. Jesus was showing him that example. In fact, there's another story of Pastor Chuck Smith when the church first started um, accepting the hippies in. And at the time, um, the church had gotten some new carpet and... Uh, the problem was in the 60s, 70s, the hippies, they didn't wear shoes anywhere. And so they'd come in barefoot on this nice carpet and they started kind of ruining the carpet. So some of the people in the church said, Chuck, you've got to tell these hippies, you know, I, I, you know it's fine they come to church, but you've got to tell them to put some shoes on because it's ruining the carpet. And apparently the, the um, meeting got a little heated that people were really, you know, Put the shoes on the hippies. <laughs> well, the next Sunday, as uh, some of those in that meeting show up to church, there's a line out the door. 
And they're kind of wondering, well, why, why, isn't, why aren't people going in? Well, once they get inside the church, they see at the front of the sanctuary, before anyone walked in, Chuck was there with a bowl of water and a rag, washing the feet of the hippies as they were going in. And where did that example come from? Well, we know it came from Jesus. Again, the whole idea of leadership, the whole idea of hierarchy in the kingdom of God is flipped upside down from what our world tells us. Our world tells us again that we need to outdo those around us to make ourselves look better. And then once we, we reach leadership status, well, that's when we do less and people do more for us. But you see that. Maybe you see that at your job. The CEO walks in and, you know, hey, do, do you need a cup of coffee? Can I get you something? Can I do this for you? Can I do that for you? Usually it's not the, uh, I work at a, a credit union, usually it's not the teller who has a, um, an assistant, but it's the people in charge who have the assistants doing f- stuff for them. And I get why. I'm not knocking assistants or anything, but that's the natural order in our world is, is the, the more you go up, the more things people do for you. In fact, later on in chapter 10, so just the next chapter, surprise, the, disi- the disciples will still be arguing about who's the greatest, <laughs> still. And Jesus tells them that, you know, you guys are desiring to be the one in charge and you want to be, you know, you want to be able to tell James where to go and John what to do and Peter, you know, what he should say. He goes, but it's the Gentiles or really the world that, exor- that desire to exercise authority over people, that, that desire to exercise authority over people, because that's what the world does. But the true desire of a disciple of Jesus, their desire is not to exercise authority over people. Their desire should be to serve people. So he tells them here in verse 35, if anyone desires to be first, he shall be last of all and servant, and again, of all. And what do you think that word all means in the Greek? All. Everyone. Put yourself at the very bottom. That's who the true leaders are. Verse 36 Then he took a little child and set him in the midst of them. And when he had taken him in his arms, he said to them, whoever receives one of these little children in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. So now he shows a great example of how they could practically do this. They're probably saying servant of all. Does that mean I need to go into, because in the Roman society they had slavery. Does that mean I need to go into slavery now? Is that what a disciple does? But children in that culture weren't really looked on as important. In fact, they weren't counted in census. They weren't, um, really until they were of age, they were really nothing. If anything, they were just property for the parents, especially in the Roman culture. So for someone like Christ or even the disciples to take time to spend with the kids would be seen as odd in their culture. Jesus was thought by many to be a great rabbi, a great teacher. Not many rabbis or teachers bothered with the little children at all. I'm just going to speak to the adults. This is the adult time. Let me speak to them. The ones who can do things. The ones who can, you know, give money. The ones who can (laughs) help me out. Until he tells them, if you receive one of these little children in my name, you receive, receives me, and not only just me, but him who sent me. By doing this, you're not just doing what I'm telling you to do. You're not just good in my eyes, but you're good in the eyes of the Lord. And in verse 38, he continues. Now John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. 
But Jesus said, do not forbid him, for no one who works a miracle in my name can soon afterward speak evil of me. For he who is not against us is on our side. Whoever gives you a cup of water to drink in my name, because you belong to Christ, assuredly I say to you, he will by no means lose his reward. Now, it's kind of interesting here. We don't ever hear a response from the disciples about their argument about who's the greatest and about being a servant. But instead, we see John kind of almost deflect what Jesus was saying, and they say, well, you know what, Lord, uh, just, a, just a little bit ago, we saw someone trying to um, cast out demons in your name, and, and we told them, hey, stop that. And why is that? Because they weren't part of the inner circle. They weren't part of their group. They didn't go to First Baptist Church of Jesus. <laughs> what we see here is the first attempt at denominations. <laughs> They're not part of us. They don't do things our way. They don't worship in our building. See, the problem was not what the man was doing. They didn't have a problem with him casting out demons. The problem was that he was not part of their group. Throughout the Gospels, when Jesus tells someone, if you, you, know, if you want to be saved, he never tells anyone that they have to now be a part of their group. In fact, many times people try to go with Jesus and he tells them, no, stay. Stay where you are. Preach where you are. Tell people about what I've done for you here. He doesn't say if you, if you the only way to be saved is to, to literally physically follow me. But he says that they must have faith. And again, I wish I could say that this kind of thinking was no longer around in, our chur in the church today. But it is. For me, I grew up, um, I grew up in Calvary Chapel. It's pretty much the only church I've known. I've gone to some other churches, been a part of some other churches, other denominations and whatnot. But I've always gone and been a part of a Calvary Chapel. And growing up, I've heard from, from people that Calvary Chapel is the only way to do it. Oh, if they're not a Calvary, they're probably not good. And the longer I've been in it, and the longer I've uh, been around meeting other people and part of other denominations and other churches, the more it breaks my heart to hear that. That we really think that we got it figured out. Calvary Chapel didn't get started until the 1960s. Uh, imagine if we are so arrogant to think that for almost 2,000 years the church didn't have it figured out until Chuck Smith came around. <laughs> How arrogant could we be? And that really goes for any of the churches. The Methodists to think that, oh, it wasn't until John Wesley came around that, you know, the church had no idea what they were doing. Thank God John Wesley came around. Or even Martin Luther. Oh, you know, the, the Reformed people. Oh, well, you know, the church was just blah until Martin Luther came. Thank God for Martin Luther in the 1500s. 1500 years, the church was just, you know, horrible. Interestingly enough about Martin Luther, he never desired to start to separate from the Catholic Church. He just desired like the biblical way to just reform the church from the inside out. This is something that permeates, especially here in America, I would say more than where we have so many options, right? Right? And now it's not even just what denomination are you. Uh, I, I get questions all the time around, from around here because Calvary Chapel isn't very well known around here. But they'll say, are you non-denominational? And, you know, we, we technically are. Yeah, we're non-denominational, but we're an association of churches. There's uh, a, a lot of Calvary Chapels all over the world. Just We're just autonomous. We're not ruled by anyone outside of the elder board and um, in the Lord in this church. But even then, it's like, oh, if you're part of a denomination, you're bad. Or if you're part of a non-denominational church, you're bad. 
Jesus really cuts through that. And again, we see that the disciples as a group were trying to make themselves superior to even this guy that's trying to do the work of the Lord. And he tells them, for he who is not against us is on our side. It's baffling to me, sickening to me, I should say, that there are churches out there that actually compete against one another. Now, they won't upright and say it. You know, I'm not gonna put out a commercial, you know, bashing other churches. But so often we we can do things, say things, act in certain ways to try and compete against other churches. Oh, that church down the road, they're having, you know, they're having this at their Christmas service. Well, you know what? We need to have that. We need to have better. Because we need to get, the people that are going in, into their door should be coming into our door because we do it the right way. How arrogant. How unchristlike. I know even since we've moved here, we've, you know, the, the one thing about when, when you move out to um, pastor a church is you don't have a chance to go visit any other churches really. <laughs> and, um, but I've, I, there has been times where I've gotten to on during the week. Um, I have a, a couple people I know who are pastors or are part of different churches and I've gone to different things and, and, and then there's even some things I've heard from people about some of these other churches. Oh, well, they do this, or they don't do that, or they have it this way, they have it that way, and that's why they're not good. And then I go, and then I see that, you know, hey, there's people, there's sincere people here seeking the Lord, and I see people leading the church, and they're, they do it a lot differently than us. Maybe, you know, they, they don't look like this. Maybe they dress a lot nicer. Maybe they teach out of a different Bible. Maybe they do this, they do that. But guess what? They're doing the work of the Lord. They're not against us, and they're on our side. And we should pray for those churches. I would hope they're praying for us. Again, what he's trying to do is to show them that there's no hierarchy in the kingdom of God, but anyone who's on the Lord's side is on our side. They're on our team. And he even tells them in verse 41 that you know, if they give you a cup of water in my name because you belong to Christ, the surely I say to you who by no means loses reward, he's even telling them that like, we should be encouraging and, and even if we can, helping those other ones do the work of the Lord. Well, verse 42 as he's just encouraged us what to do, now he encourages us um, what we shouldn't be doing, or I guess what, what we should be doing when we shouldn't be doing what we shouldn't be doing. We'll get that. Let me read it. But whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter into life maimed rather than having two hands to go to hell into the fire that will never be quenched where the worm does, their worm does not die and their fire is not quenched. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame rather than having two feet to be cast into hell into the fire that shall never be quenched where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And if your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye rather than having two eyes to be cast into hellfire where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus here gives these great warnings. And there's a lot that have said, well, Jesus never talked about hell. Yes, he did. He talked about hell more than he did heaven. And Jesus is very blatant about warning people about going to hell. There's, a teaching, there's teachings out there that'll say, oh, well, Jesus say, is gonna save everyone. He would never let anyone go to hell. He did everything he could to stop anyone from going to hell. But some people just wanna buy their own ticket anyways. And he has these, these great warnings. And the first warning is actually about causing one of the little ones, one of the children, or, or even uh, in another context, it could be new believers to stumble. 
know, there's, there's, whether if it's a new believer context, it's all those cults out there, those people pushing these dangerous doctrines. Or even as he probably has, the little child still maybe in his lap, and he says, and he points to this child, whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to stumble, it would be better if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. It's amazing in our day and age that we have so many who desire to corrupt the young minds of our children, whether it be school or on the screen or just in the neighborhood or even in the home. I mean, on social media, I've, I've unfortunately seen these, these parents getting their little kids to, to cuss and they think it's so funny, you know, a little two-year-old saying a word, they have no idea what it is and oh, let me send that to everyone to see. Jesus here says that their end is worse than having a millstone hung around their neck and sent them thrown into the sea. A millstone was something they would use to grind the wheat. It was a big, heavy stone. And he says, it'd be, it, what's, what's happening, what's gonna happen to them for those people that do those things, it'd be better if they had concrete shoes like they, <laughs> the mafia does. <laughs> it'd be better They'd be better off. Their end is worse than having that done. And then this next warning is actually split into three examples. If your hand, your foot, or your eye causes you to sin, he tells them to cut it off or to cut it out. Because he says it's better for you to enter life whether it's maimed, lame, or with one eye than to have Two hands, two feet, and two eyes and going into hell where the worm does not die. The worm being like the small, he's just using that as an example of a small defenseless animal, or, you know, insect that if it's around fire, it's just gonna, it's gonna be quenched. He says, no, there's not even relief for the worm, the smallest thing. And the fire is not quenched. The fire always burns. There's another, some other teachings out there of annihilationism where that we will only burn, people in hell will only burn for a certain amount of time. And after that, they're annihilated. They're no longer there. Because God would never allow someone to eternally suffer. You're right, God did everything he could to stop people from eternally suffering. He sent his son, Jesus Christ, so that they wouldn't. Because when God created hell, we're told that hell was not created for man. Hell was created for Satan and his demons. And what's happened is Satan and his demons have convinced people to follow them. To go down their path that leads to destruction. And so Jesus here tells them it's better to go into life, go into heaven, maimed, lame, or with one eye, which, by the way, when we have our new bodies, he's not, this isn't a doctrine saying that, you know, we'll, we're going to enter if you, you know, if you were born without an arm, you're not going to go into heaven without an arm. We're told that we'll be made complete, perfect, whole. But he says that if there's something in your life causing you to sin, cut it off, get it out. That could be a show, a TV show, a movie, music. That could be a person, you know, your old high school buddy that you just, you know, every Thursday night you gotta spend with him and, you know, it's something you've done since you were 14. Why would you stop now? Maybe it's that, that uh, old fling from high school that just messaged you on Facebook. I haven't talked to, haven't talked to her in 20 years, man. I'm just checking to see how she's doing. My wife wouldn't mind. Maybe it's a place you go to. A restaurant, a bar. People you hang out with, a group of people. There's that people at work, man, they just, they, they really love to indulge themselves after work. And you know, yeah, I wanna be part of the team, so I'm gonna go hang out with them after work.
Jesus says that if there's something in here causing you, maybe it's, maybe it's a website going, you're going to. And the website in and of itself is, is okay, but it leads to things that aren't okay. Cut it off. Get it out. Get rid of it. It's not worth your eternity. If there's something that causes you to sin, get rid of it. There is nothing worth more than our holiness. And again, Jesus paints this really gruesome picture of what we should be willing to give up. He says, you should cut off your hand if it's causing you to sin. Now this isn't encouragement that if you're a kleptomaniac always stealing, that, well, the, the, the thing would be to cut off your hands. Trust me, I, I'm sure you could find other ways to steal. <laughs> Because the problem isn't your hands. The problem isn't your feet. The problem isn't your mouth. The problem isn't, any, the problem is your heart. And we see this in our own culture with all the, the legislation they want to do. We, we need to stop people from doing this. We, I mean, yes, I want them to stop them from doing that. But you're treating the symptom. You're not treating the problem. The problem is the heart. He says that we should cut it off because it's better to enter into heaven maimed than to go into hell whole. And the message is clear. If you're not willing to give up your sin, then the only fruit of that is hell and eternal torment. Now he's not saying that if we as Christians who are saved, just, you know, sin once, and maybe we might even struggle with a certain sin, that we're just gonna go to hell. He's talking about someone who is willingly sinning, unwilling to give up their sin. And as a Christian, I don't think anyone, I don't think you can be a Christian and be unwilling to give up your sin. Again, you might have weak moments where you do sin. You might have a certain sin you just have constantly struggle with. But you're, you're willing to give it up and you want to give it up and you go to the Lord for forgiveness. But he's talking about someone who doesn't do that. Someone who just doesn't care. In verse 49 and 50, Jesus kind of finishes his original answer to who's the greatest. For everyone will be seasoned with fire and every sacrifice will be seasoned with salt. Salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. See here Jesus, uh, he finally answers their question of who's the greatest. And he tells them all your works are gonna be tested with fire one day. That's what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3.13. Each one's work will become clear for the day will declare it. That's the day of judgment because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. See, they were arguing with one another about who's the greatest. And Jesus says, the Lord is the one who will determine that one day. Don't worry about it here on this earth. What, what you should worry about is the salt you have. He says salt is good, but if the salt loses its flavor, will you, how will you season it? Have salt in yourselves and have peace with one another. In another section, he tells us that we're the salt of the earth. We're the, we as believers are the ones that season the earth, if you will. We give flavor to the earth. Without us, without the church, the Holy Spirit inside the church working, you know, this earth would really be horrible. In fact, I was just reading um, some numbers for this past year that uh, I think they said 70% of charitable donations given in America were given by Christians. And just... And then you have the people, oh, you gotta abolish the church, tax the church, do all the, the church is worthless, it's good for nothing, Christians good. Without, without the church, there'd be no hospitals, there'd be no schools. These things that uh, we depend on were started by Christians. 
because it was the work of the Lord. What Jesus is telling them, stop worrying about if you're better than one another. Just worry about yourself. Worry about your salt. Have peace with one another. All we need to focus on is what the Lord has called us to do. And every sacrifice in verse 49 says will be seasoned with salt. Um, This is a reference to um, the offerings that the children of Israel would make. They would season it with salt. They would have to season it with salt. Salt being a preserving agent as well. We as the church are preserving in a way the earth. We're told later on that, that judgment will not come. Judgment's being held back until something's removed. I believe that's the church being removed, the rapture. That we being the preserving agent of this world, once we're removed, well, there's nothing to preserve it. And so the Lord tells them, don't worry about, have salt in yourselves, worry about yourselves, have peace with one another. We have work that we're called to do, not worrying about if we're the best, if we're the greatest. So in closing this morning, anyone who desires to be great in the kingdom, as Jesus says, has to be a servant. And our greatest reason and example is in Christ himself. He was the greatest servant and he gave up all to serve us. When he came down, as we celebrate this season, the incarnation of Christ, he gained nothing from coming down, nothing. He gained nothing from saving us. Believe it or not, he'd gain nothing from saving you. (laughs) He does not need you, but he wants you. He desires to have a relationship with you. And he serves us. He serves us and, and we should follow his example and serve others. And that's, that's how you're the greatest by being the least. By serving others, not making yourself better. Well, next week we're gonna start chapter 10. Next week we have um, probably everyone's favorite topic, marriage and divorce. It's gonna be a good one. We're gonna talk about um, what really the biblical idea of marriage and divorce is. So let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much just for this morning. We thank you for your great example of being the greatest servant. So Lord, help us, fill us with your spirit as we leave this place to be the servants to everyone we come and encounter with, knowing that we're not serving them, but we're really serving you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Why don't we stand for this last song, and I hope to see you guys Wednesday as we study the plagues in Egypt.